Welcome to the second symposium on federalism preemption in state law. The Uniform Law Commission is pleased this year to sponsor the symposium with the Georgetown University Law Center and to have this wonderful, truly wonderful venue at Georgetown for this event. We are pleased that a number of national organizations that work with us on the intersection between federal and state interest are co-sponsoring the symposium, the National Governors Association, the Conference of Chief Justices, the National Center for State Courts, the National Conference of State Legislatures, the Council of State Governments, and the National Association of Attorneys General. I know that representatives of these organizations are here, and I ask that they stand and be recognized. Thank you all for being here this morning. I'd also like to recognize several of my many colleagues from the Uniform Law Commission who are here. Judge Harriet Lansing, chair of the ULC Executive Committee. Uh, Ray Pepe, who is chair of the Uniform Law Commission Committee on Federalism and State Law. ULC Executive Director John Siebert. And also our new ULC Legislative Director and former, Min former Minnesota legislator, uh, Terry Morrow, who is in the back by the coffee. Uh, many others from the conference are in attendance, and I want to thank you all for being here this morning. Under the leadership of the Uniform, of Uniform Law Commission past president, uh, Bob Stein, we held our first symposium on federalism, preemption in state law, in October of 2010. This symposium is intended to further explore the roles of federal and state government in areas of law in which various levels of state government share responsibility. In particular, we hope today to have a useful dialogue among representatives of federal, state, and local government about the ways in which the balance of federal and state responsibilities in areas of mutual interest is currently working or not working, particularly with regard to legislative and regulatory matters. It is our hope that the discussions today will develop some useful ideas as to how federal, state, and local governments might collaborate more effectively concerning legislation and regulation in areas of mutual interest. You should know that the symposium is being videotaped. Uh, the videotape, however, is intended for ULC use and possible posting on our website, but we do not intend to distribute the videotape widely. It will not be coming to a theater near you anytime soon. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker and my good friend, the governor of the state of Delaware and chair of the NGA, Jack Markell. Um, I have known and worked with Governor Markell for over 15 years. I actually calculated that this morning. Uh, I think it's more or less correct. The governor has not only materially and masterfully navigated our home state of Delaware through the worst financial crisis in decades, but in the process has reformed our pension system, successfully promoted economic development in the state, and placed us in the forefront nationally of education reform, all while maintaining Delaware's preeminence as a leader in corporate and commercial law in the United States. In his spare time, the governor has, among other things, chaired the Democratic Governors Association, as well as the National Governors Association, with energy and distinction. Governor Markell's background as a business executive has made him especially well qualified to lead our state and the NGA during these difficult fiscal times. The governor and I have worked together on challenges which Delaware has faced as a result of developments at the federal level affecting matters of great importance to our state, such as maintaining the integrity of the state corporate franchise, regulation of financial institutions, issues relating to bankruptcy venue, and many, many more. Changes in the historical balance between federal and state law, and in these and many other areas, have a significant impact on our state and on many other states as well. As both governor of Delaware, chair of the NGA, I know that Governor Markell brings a truly unique perspective to issues which strike at the proper balance of state and federal authority within our federal system, it is with great pleasure that I introduce my friend, the protector of the Uniform Law Commission budget in the state of Delaware, the chair of the National Governors Association and the governor of the state of Delaware, Jack Markell.
Well, good morning, everybody. Great to be with you. I want to uh, thank Mike. He is a, uh, a certainly an accomplished lawyer, a great uh, Delawarean. Uh, as you may know, in his practice at uh, Morris Nichols, he uh, has a number of very important government entity uh, clients, including the Delaware, Delaware River Bay Authority uh, and the Port of Wilmington. And somehow, uh, in addition to all of his responsibilities to his legal clients, he finds time uh, to be a leader in the very important work of the Uniform Law Commission. Uh, we are proud to call him one of our own, and we're proud to have a, a Delawarean uh, leading the, Del the Uniform Law Commission. Now, we have been, uh, first of all, I want to thank Mike, because, you know, I get to speak, as you can imagine, in this role, I speak, you know, many times a day, and normally I get to say the same things every time. When this invitation came in, I said, I can't give my typical remarks about education and the economy in Delaware, and I really got to step back and uh, learn something. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to do that. So uh, we've really tried to frame the, our, the comments today in terms of where we, uh, as not just Delaware, but where states sit in this incredibly exciting journey about uh, sort of defining relationships between the federal uh, and, and state uh, governments. We have been in Delaware an enthusiastic supporter of our federal system of government and the role that the Uniform Law Commission plays in making that system work from the very beginning. And we're known as the first state because we were the first state to ratify uh, the, federal, the federal constitution. We're also among the original seven states represented at the first meeting in Sarasota Springs, New York in 19, excuse me, in 1892 of the Conference of State Boards of, Permit, of Commissioners on Promoting Uniformity of Law in the United States. So as a small state, we have uh, long understood that there are problems that transcend our borders and that can only be su uh, successfully addressed in coordination uh, with our fellow states. And yet as a state of neighbors, we have also very much long prized the freedom that our federal system affords us uh, to develop uh, creative policy approaches that are tailor-made for us and uh, really for our unique circumstances in Delaware. And so the work that the Uniform Law Commission does, we believe is essential uh, to all of that. The Constitution gives us a roadmap. It delineates the authority of the, federal, of the federal government and the states respectively. But the point is that that roadmap is not enough. Our society is too complicated. We are too interdependent. And so there are no easy lines to, uh, lines to be drawn to separate areas of state and federal power. There is and will continue to be jurisdictional uh, overlap in just about every public policy area that you can think of. So elected officials at the local, the state, and the federal level, we all represent the same people. We each seek in our own way to be uh, responsive to the concerns of our constituents. And if we're not careful, we will step on and we will stifle each other in ways that are harmful to the very people that we all serve. Now, by itself, the fact that the Constitution deline delineates the respective federal and state authority that does not ensure the adoption of policies that are adequate in their scope and flexible enough to preserve the freedom of states to innovate. That challenge is left up to all of us who operate within the framework that the Constitution establishes, to federal policymakers, to state and to local policymakers, and the institutions like the Uniform Law Commission, and for that matter, the National Governors Association that play uh, essentially intermediating roles. And I want to thank David Parkhurst from NGA, uh, who is here. So it's up to us on a day-by-day, issue-by-issue basis to strike this, um, this delicate balance that a well-functioning federal system demands between national-level coordination and the s diversity that you find at the state level. And striking that delicate balance is something that governors spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, governors are obviously committed to maintaining this balanced federal system. We also believe that states, as the laboratories of democracy, can and should be on the front lines of developing solutions uh, to the nation's most pressing issues, economic growth and job creation, health care, education, and more. But to provide these solutions, we've got to have the room to reform, uh, redesign, and redirect the state policies, as well as priorities. And so through the National Governors Association, which as Mike mentioned, I have the honor of chairing this year, the nation's governors have outlined what a balanced uh, federal system should look like. And central uh, to that vision 
are flexibility, the ideas of flexibility and partnership. We need the flexibility to, to take care of the unique needs of our citizens and the unique challenges uh, facing our states. And we would hope that the federal government would see the states not as obstacles uh, to be preempted, not as an obstacle to be commanded, but rather as a partner that can contribute to identifying and implementing solutions that work. And so in my own state, I've seen a number of examples of the federal system working the way it's supposed to. I've seen what can be accomplished when states are given flexibility and when we're treated as partners. So consider uh, President Obama's signature education initiative, Race to the Top. We, we in Delaware developed a bold and innovative Race to the Top plan. We had significant support from stakeholders, very broad support. And the federal government recognized the promise of that plan by investing federal money to help us implement it. So instead of adopting a one-size-fits-all solution and imposing it on the states, President Obama invited states to innovate, and he invested in that innovation. So essentially what he did, he said to the states, think about how you can improve your schools in your own states, bring forward your plans, and we'll put money behind the plans that we believe are the most promising. And in doing so, he did bring forth new thinking and new energy uh, from states. So that new thinking and that new energy resulted in many exciting new models that other states can emu emulate and will emulate. <laughs> and that was for the fraction of the cost of what would have been a top-down mandated solution. At a fraction of that cost, the federal go government has driven change as well as improvement across the country. The administration is taking a similar approach to driving health innovation. Delaware recently received a grant from the Centers for, from the Department of Health and Human Services to help us develop a state health innovation plan. So what we're doing here, we are pulling together, and again, this is thanks to the partnership with the federal government, but we're designing this at a state level. We're pulling together stakeholders and experts for six months of intensive brainstorm, brainstorming, uh, conversation, and planning. We're going to be looking among, at, among other things, at ways to change the way that health healthcare is paid for in the state and to improve our collection and the use of data. To, so basically to find this holy grail of reducing cost and improving quality at the same time. And we actually we believe that that can uh, be done. So our ambition, as it, as it was with Race to the Top, is to develop a plan uh, that can be a model for other states. Uh, and if we succeed in developing this promising plan, the prospect, it, it, the prospect exists that we could get a follow-on grant for implementation. We're not the only state doing this. Some very exciting work, for example, being done in Oregon and Arkansas. And in the same way that perhaps states will learn from us in, in some areas, we're going to learn from the work uh, that they're doing. So these are obviously very big issues, uh, ed educating our kids, controlling health care costs. And I don't believe the president would, would not, I don't believe the president would be doing his job if he weren't driving uh, at this kind of innovation. Uh, but he also wouldn't be doing his job if he wasn't um, treating states as partners in these efforts, giving us the flexibility that we need both to innovate and to tailor solutions for our unique needs. And so the hope of governors across the country is that this spirit of partnership will extend to the other big issues that are on Washington's plate and on our plates uh, back home in our, in, in our states. So, and this is a message that we've had a chance to deliver to the president and to Speaker Boehner and Leader Reid as they work to address sequestration and deficit reduction. We know that spending cuts are inevitable, as are tough choices. So what we have asked is that the president and the leaders of Congress keep four points in mind. One, reforms should produce savings both for the federal government and for states. That's number one. Number two, deficit reduction should not be accomplished merely by shifting spending from the federal side to the state side. That really doesn't accomplish uh, very much. Similarly, imposing unfunded mandates does not help. Number three, states should be given increased flexibility to create efficiencies and achieve results. And number four, we don't believe that Congress should impose additional maintenance of effort requirements as a condition of funding. In, in other words, if, fed, if, the, if the feds cut our funding, then they should not demand the same level of service without, 
with, without providing that same level of funding. So if they cut the funding, we shouldn't be expected to provide the same level of service. Governors of both parties have, have long taken a leadership role in advocating for additional infra infrastructure investment at a time when other countries are far outpacing our own investments. And especially states need uh, federal funding stability and certainty to pursue longer term planning and project uh, delivery. Many of us have used innovative financing tools, such as public private private partnerships to deal with the public funding shortfalls and as, as we try to shore up infrastructure. And that's why it's so important to our taxpayers that we protect tax exempt financing for infrastructure and the deductibility of state and local taxes, which, which provide critical support to infrastructure uh, projects. And that's why we support state flexibility to make in, in investments in infrastructure projects through existing and new self-sustaining financing uh, mechanisms. And just as infrastructure investments are vital to our economic competitiveness, so too is workforce development. Governors are seeking greater flexibility in the use of federal training funds. So, we, and we, right now the, the, the workforce development funds flow in lots and lots of different line items. And we're saying, give us some flexibility. Let us move from, let us move money from one line item to the next as it best fits in our state. So, and, and, and again, in the area of education, there's a need to revisit the No Child Left Behind Act and to provide greater flexibility, perhaps in the spirit of race to the top. While waivers work for some states, waivers will not work for every state. And more importantly, waivers really only provide a temporary fix to a long-term problem. Governors are not alone in our concerns. Uh, mayors, legislators, chief state school officers, local school, school board members uh, agree. There ought to be a permanent, fair, and flexible fix uh, to this. But even when it comes to that, that issue more than any other, what's con it's considered paradigm, well, it's, it's considered let me step back. Whether it's any of those issues or whether it is an issue that most people think of as traditionally in the realm only of the federal government, which is national security, the reality is that the federal-state partnership has been and will continue to be indispensable. Governor, and you, you may, if, if you don't follow this closely, you may not, it may not be something that uh, you, know, you really think about much, but governors are actually very much partners and the maintenance of the nation's armed forces, because each of us serve as the commander in chief of the National Guard in our states. The National Guard plays an unbelievably important role in responding to emergencies at home, as well as fighting alongside our active duty forces overseas. And as Congress and the administration examine alternatives to the current state of Homeland Security uh, grant funds, governors will work in partnership with the federal government to ensure that our first responders are equipped with the tools they need to accomplish their life-saving missions. Now, this is actually, we, we've been very focused on this issue recently. The nation has begun the development of a, of a critical tool for first responders by providing sufficient radio spectrum for the construction of a broad, broadband network for public safety communications. You know, historically, this has been locality by locality. And as a result, there's been very little interoperability between states. The National Governors Association was, played a key role in gaining enactment of legislation to create a national broadband system, as the federal government was considering what to do with a pretty significant block of excess radio spectrum. We weighed in heavily that there's a huge public sector benefit, around, uh, particularly around public safety. And so we very, played a critical role in getting the legislation passed and will continue to play a strong role in the development, maintenance, and operation of the network. And so what this will do is provide first responders with the most modern and reliable communications uh, capabilities available. And as an example, I mean, just imagine if somebody is in an ambulance, they've been picked up in an ambulance, they're on their way to, to the doctor, and there's a video camera within the ambulance that can be sending real-time video to the doctor so the doctor knows exactly what they're getting. We have an issue across the country now on state borders with sometimes uh, not particularly good operability. And you could have first responders from one state responding 
uh, to people right on the border. They may be going to a hospital in the other state. And so putting all this together in one network we think is really important. So the spirit that governors seek to foster in federal state relations is the spirit that has animated the work that you do at the Uniform Law Commission from the beginning. We know that the commission has its origins in legislation from 1881 in New York. In the midst of the Industrial Revolution, recognizing the states were becoming increasingly interdependent, the New York legislature authorized its governor to appoint three commissioners to explore the most effective way in which to <coughs> achieve uniformity of law to address problems that are common in multiple states. That led to the meeting of the seven uh, states in 1882 and later to the commission with its representation from all the states. And from the beginning, this was about addressing big problems in a manner that states had difficulty doing alone. And I think this example I just gave you about the radio spectrum is, is, very, is a good example of that. But this was a state-led initiative. And from the beginning, innovation and diversity were respected and encouraged. And it's in that spirit that our country should approach the challenges of this incredibly interdependent world that we live in today. Our challenges are large, and quite often they are shared. And at the same time, innovation is more important than ever, and it is more likely to come from the laboratories of democracy than, they, than, the, than, they, than it's to come from Washington. So to respect that diversity is more important than ever today. As the world shrinks, our local character and the unique qualities of our diverse communities becomes ever more indispensable to our quality of life. And if the Uniform Law Commission has its way, if the National Governors Association has its way, a flexible federal state partnership will be the way of the future and we will all be better off for it. So I appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts uh, with you. Uh, as I was telling uh, Judge Lansing earlier, when Mike Calton calls to ask if we show up, we show up. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to have done so. And I'm happy to take questions if people have any or to let you get on with the work of the... Now, I'd like to, to see if there are any questions from the floor uh, for the governor uh, and invite you to please do so. Thank you, Governor. Um, one of the issues <clears throat> that I've found that I really don't understand is quite how the Council of State Governments, the uh, Governors Association that you're chair of and so on, intercede with the federal government when it decides to start doing something that you feel is inimical to the uh, relationship between the state and federal government. And the me mechanism of that isn't very clear, and I know it's a politics and you push and pull and all that, but tell me how, what your experience is. Well, I'm glad it's not very clear to you because it's not very clear to me sometimes. <laughs> um, and the answer is it's difficult because the, uh, the National Governors Association is a bipartisan organization and uh, we try to get significant consensus. And that's easier on some issues than it is on others. So I will tell you, for example, um, particularly before the election, uh, the idea of the National Governors Association coming out with anything uh, concrete on health care, it was not going to happen because there were just there was a fair degree of polarization uh, on that issue. So what we do is a couple things. We, we do look for opportunities where there's a, a good level of consensus. And so, for example, this idea, the two that will come to mind first, this idea that the, the, the broadband uh, spectrum for a national system is one. Uh, the second is some of the work that we've been doing with the Council of Governors, with the Pentagon. Democrat, Democrats and Republicans alike uh, very much believe that the National Guard is a very effective way of, for the nation, a very cost of way, effective way for the nation to uh, deliver uh, much of its security needs. And so when it looks like the National Guard is being hit disproportionately, even though it's much more cost effective than active duty um, uh, troops, uh, we get together and we make that clear and we, we talk with the Pentagon about that. So that, those are two specific things. And then there's a, there's a bigger area that we tend to agree on, even if uh, we don't agree, always agree in the details. And that has to do with the, the nature of we want more flexibility. And so I mentioned as an example the, the workforce training funds. And you know, the idea is workforce training, is when you think about an economy like the one we're in, we're the most frustrating conversation that any governor Democrat or Republican can have with the business in our states is when the business tells us they've got openings, but they can't find people with the right skills. And so when we have a variety of workforce training programs available, we want the flexibility to be able to move funding from one area 
to the next as it makes sense in our state. And so basically what we're arguing for is more uh, flexibility. The flexibility argument uh, cuts across uh, just about every issue you can think of. Education, health care, uh, for sure, are, are a couple of them. We tend to see the world the same way on transportation issues, in the, particularly in the sense that it's, you know, many of these transportation projects can take years to deliver. And so the idea that we go from year to year without knowing what the out years are going to look like in terms of transportation funding is a problem. And so that's something that we, that we weigh in on. So it depends upon, you know, what the issue is will largely dictate how much consensus there is. If there's truly not consensus, we won't weigh in. Uh, but what we try to do is work. We, we do have a committee process. We have, uh, I think, now five standing committees. We have one on uh, health. We have one on education. We have one on economic development. We have one on natural resources. And we've got one on uh, homeland security. Although homeland security may now be part of health, I think. I'm getting a signal from the back of the room. So we have four or five standing committees. Each committee always has a, a two leaders, a Democrat and a Republican. One serves as chair, one ser serves as vice chair. And the work of the NGA, especially over the last couple of years, we've really moved it, is, is done through these committees. And so at the beginning of the year, the and every governor serves on one committee. So the committees get together and they define what the policy priority areas are for the next year. That then defines the work of the NGA in two areas. The, the NGA really has two primary avenues to get its work done. The first is a federal lobbying effort. And we have people who are here in Washington and who are on the Hill and they bring governors in uh, to testify. And on, you know, on the issues as defined by these committees. And if, and if there are four committees, each one may only have three main objectives. We, could, we, tr we really try to narrow it down. There are lots of other things, but we have to whittle it down so that the lobbying work can be focused. So that's the one area. And then the second area is what we call our Center for Best Practices. It's essentially a think tank and typically raised uh, grant funding. And we provide intellectual thought leadership uh, to states on how they can do better in one area or the next. But we try as much as possible to focus that work in the areas that have been defined by the committees. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's about as specific as I can get. Hi, Governor. Hi. My name is Bart Davis, and I, I do serve in a legislature. Where are you? Uh, in Idaho. Uh -huh. um, and although I am not in the same party as you, I join you in your uh, concern about the effect of sequestration. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of us had hoped that when March 1st hit, that we would see some collaboration, meaningful collaboration to problem solving. It doesn't currently seem to me that that is as much of a focus as I had hoped it would be. As you work with your colleagues uh, with NGA, and as a governor, knowing how much federal money is in all of our state budgets, <clears throat> how are, are you handling that? How are your colleagues handling that? I don't mean specific. I mean, as you look at the, the mandates that still exist, and I realize you've spoken in part to this, uh, but with the mandates that still exist, how do we not find that being a substantial friction between states and federal government? And are you hearing things from inside of the Beltway that give you confidence that we're going to be all right? I don't mean financially, but in resolving that conflict between the federal government and our state. <coughs> Would that make sense? It did certainly to me. Yeah, it's a, it's a big question. Um, and as I, I, as I did mention, and, and back in November, sort of leading up to the debt deal that, that was being discussed at the end of the year, leading up to sequestration, I brought six governors. There were three Democrats and three Republicans. And we sat down with the president and the vice president and their entire leadership team. And then we went to meet with Speaker Boehner and Paul Ryan and, and the speaker's leadership team. And then we went and we met with uh, 
uh, Leader Reed and his leadership team. And we essentially uh, laid out a couple of things. First of all, we said it was important to us that we have a seat at the table. We recognize that they have this difficult decisions to make. Uh, we didn't, uh, we're not living in a fantasy world where those decisions will not affect us. Uh, but we did ask for them to uh, you know, consider the impact on states. And I mentioned some of the principles before that we outlined to them, like the idea that just if, if all you're doing to solve your problem is moving the spending to the states, that really doesn't solve anything. And so please keep that in, please keep that in mind. <clears throat> we also did, did give them some specific examples. Governor Beebe uh, from Arkansas, for instance, mentioned in special education uh, to the extent that uh, the federal government cuts the amount of money available to states for special education. We've got to be relieved of some of these specific requirements that are built into the law. And so I can't say that I'm hearing a lot uh, that inspires confidence. Uh, I just think the divide between the parties right now seems to be uh, quite significant, and I think it's important that the, uh, you know, that the members of uh, Congress of both parties hear from their constituents. And I will tell you, for example, that uh, one of the governors I brought with me, uh, Governor Gary Herbert of Utah, uh, Republican, and he talked very specifically about his, his concern that the economy in Utah could be very much negatively impacted uh, by sequestration. And so what we're trying to explain is that the results of sequestration affect us in a couple different areas. We can be very specific uh, about the impact on our budget in terms of the cutoff of federal funds in specific program areas. We know exactly now what those dollars are and where they're hitting. They're hitting us in a uh, head start. They're hitting us in uh, workforce development. They're hitting us in, uh, in, in job, in, in um, uh, substance abuse treatment. So we, we know that and we can try to backstop some of those cuts or not. It's very difficult in most states. Uh, so that's one area. But the other area that really hasn't gotten as much attention, but I am absolutely just as concerned about, is what's the effect on our economy? I mean, to the extent that you have uh, a lot of federal employees, to the extent that you've got an Air Force base, certainly the National Guard people who are put on furlough, uh, they're not going to, you know, if they're getting furloughed for you know, 14 days or whatever it is, I mean, for a lot of people, that's the extra spending money that gets them by. And to the extent that they stop spending that money in, 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 in their local communities, it has a big impact. I'm also concerned about the uh, effect of uncertainty on the, on the business community. And so we are each dealing with it as best we can, but I think it is a, uh, you know, clearly there is just such a divide uh, right now. I think a lot of us had hoped that after the election, uh, people would be able to get together and, and, and find a path. And obviously, so far, that's, not true. Not, that's just not true, and we're just going to have to forge the, the best path in our own states as we can. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Dave. My name's Dave McBride. I'm from Delaware, for those of you who don't know behind me. Uh, I had one of those frustratingly general questions to ask you, but, but I would love to get your insight on it. Um, and I ask you as someone who I think in Delaware has been very effective at bringing people together. And obviously, we are in a situation where we seem to repeatedly have the inability to bring people together to solve problems. Uh, what is your insight, either from your experience as governor or from the NGA, about bringing people together, and, and is there a difference in perspective between the governors and the senators and representatives in Washington with respect to issues? Well, I think there is a big difference. Uh, and um, so first of all, you know, as governors, we are not measured, we're not really evaluated based on how good a speech we give. We're not based on the, our rhetoric. We're measured on a few key things. Are we making our schools better? Are we creating more economic opportunity for the people of our states? Uh, are, we get, are we making sure the tax, are we doing everything we can so that taxpayers get the best possible return on their investment? Are we protecting the most vulnerable? I mean, there are, there are a handful of things. So that's what we focus on. And that tends to bring people together. So, you know, it's, it's not to say it's perfect. It's not perfect in Delaware. It's not perfect, you know, probably anywhere. But we've got to figure out a way to work with people on the other side of the aisle 
to make those things happen. Now, unfortunately, I think in, you know, in Washington, it's become something very different, particularly not just, not just the House, but I think particularly the House, because I think what's happened, there are just so many fewer moderate members of the House these days than there used to be. And I'm not saying moderation, you know, whatever that whole expression was about, uh, you know, that moderation is the virtue. But the point is, there are fewer people in the center, because particularly with gerrymandering, where what's happened over the last, certainly in 2010 and in 2000 as well, but especially more recently, there are many, many fewer members of Congress who have to worry about their general election opponent, because districts tend to be drawn much more for one party or another. So what that tends to do is it tends to make members of Congress more interested in protecting themselves against an election from somebody from the extreme of their own party. So that's exactly the opposite of saying, okay, well, how do I get, how do I work across the aisle to make things happen? So I, I think to me, that's number one. And number two, my, my belief is that with uh, cable news and all the, uh, the talk shows and everything else, people, the, the people who get most of the coverage, this is, this is not entirely fair, but I mean, I think it's pretty close. The, these media outlets are a lot more interested in people who are very strongly cued to one extreme or the other, because that sort of makes more news. I mean, how much news is it if I say I want to work with the, on the, on the, I want to work with the other side? It's not all that interesting. But if I'm shouting about you know, the rightness of my position, the wrongness of their position, that becomes more interesting, unfortunately. But I think that's what tends to happen. And so I think we've got these two structural problems that we really, uh, that, that are rel relatively new. And I'm not sure I've got any great answer for it, for it but I do know that uh, in the states, in Idaho, you know, I know being a very Republican in the state, and I don't know, you know, how many Democrats you have in the legislature, but my guess is on you know certain issues, whether it's you know education or jobs and, and the like, you know you, you will find some people who want to work with you. I'm guessing, um, and that's and that's how it's how it is in our state. It's not on every issue for sure, but I, I'm not sure how that gets extended to Washington. But I do think if you talk to most governors, uh, they'll say that you know if we focus in on those handful of issues that people really care about, uh, we're going to make more progress. Um, Connie Ring from Virginia, one of the commissioners. Um, I'd like to ask you two questions. One, a follow-up on what you were just talking about. Has the Governor's Association spent any time in analyzing the structural problem of the gerrymandered districts which result in extremism uh, of either the left or the right? Uh, is there any solution that the Governor's Association or generally any organization could deal with this uh, difficult problem? Uh, I, I'm not aware of any time that we've spent uh, on that issue. I'm sure the members of Congress would love our suggestions about how they could organize it <laughs> more effectively. Right. Um, so no, I, I don't, I'm not aware of anything that the Governor's Association has done. The way it works in most, in most states, uh, I believe, is that these lines are typically drawn uh, by the state, by the members of the state legislature. And so um, I, I'm not, and, and the governors do actually have a role because sometimes they get to veto these lines or not. Uh, but I don't believe that the governor's association has, and my guess is the governor's association won't uh, take that on uh, as an issue, as, a, as an initiative. Uh, if I could ask another question. Sure. Uh, James Madison was one of the three authors of the Federalist Papers. And in many of the uh, ones that he wrote, he talked about the delegated powers that were given to the federal government and the powers that were retained by the states as sovereign uh, entities. Uh, are there, in the light of a global world economy, <coughs> certainly a very 
strong national economy. Are there any areas that really can be sorted out as being those powers that should be exercised largely exclusively by the states? And are there any powers that the federal government doesn't have at all? <clears throat> or are we now in a situation where the realities of the world make it impossible to separate and divide the powers between the states and the federal government, except to the extent of expanding our role of collaboration and cooperation between the two uh, legal uh, entities? I think it's an excellent question. I mean, it's sort of at the very root of, uh, you know, what I was, I, I think the, the issues that I was trying to uh, talk about. I, you know, I think for the most part, you would have governors respond to that question by saying that the, uh, the issues that should be left to the states are just about everything that weren't delineated specifically as being in the province of the federal government. And it hasn't really worked out that way. And I think that's why sometimes you'll, you'll hear uh, these debates and you'll hear governors of both parties uh, trying to uh, resist further encroachment. Uh, by the federal government on uh, responsibility that are best left to the state. I mean, we, we, we really do believe, and I think this is, again, something else you find Democrats and Republicans <laughs> agree on, that this, that this idea of the laboratories of democracy is important. And, and by far the best conversations we have when we get together uh, are the governor's only meetings, where we learn from each other. There's no press. There's, no, there's really not a lot of grandstanding. Uh, we are learning from uh, each other. You know, and I think... What we try to do is get away from the overly philosophical and ideological uh, answers to those questions, and we figure out from a problem, we, we really, I think a lot of governors see ourselves more as problem solvers as opposed to just, you know, pure politicians. And so, one very specific example, most, pretty much every governor these days, unless you're in you know, maybe North Dakota and, you know, maybe there are a couple of other energy states which are doing really, really well. Most of, most of us would like our own constituents and the businesses in our states to be participating in economies that are growing faster than our own, which happens to be quite a few economies around the world because there are plenty of economies around the world which are growing faster than the American economy these days. I wish that weren't so, but it's the truth. So what do we do about it? Well, I mean, part of what I do is I want to, A, make sure that we're maximizing uh, foreign direct investment by companies in other countries into Delaware where they're investing, putting people to work. And I want to increase the export opportunities for Delaware businesses so that they can sell more around the world and therefore employ more people in Delaware. Well, we do that and we go on trade missions and the like, but we also say, how can we tap into uh, federal assistance? So to the extent, I mean, that's one thing that the the federal government, you know, there are plenty of states that do have offices in this country or that country to promote, you know, the local businesses in, in those countries. That being said, it's hard for us to duplicate the presence that the U.S. Department of Commerce or the XM Bank has around the world. And so when we, uh, tra when we travel and we do these kinds of uh, trade missions and the like, we try to tap into that. And so, I mean, my view is we ought to, you know, where, where it can be helpful, let's tap into it. Where it's an unnecessary uh, imposition, let's fight against it. And I don't think there's an, I don't think there's really an absolute, to me, it's more like an issue by issue. Let's try to figure it out. We're gonna ask the governor one more question and then my final question, and then we will uh, allow him to get back to Delaware to make sure that there's no more mischief in the legislature than there <laughs> normally is. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Governor, I, I'm Richard Cassidy, a commissioner from Vermont, and uh, I have had the pleasure and sometimes the burden of serving in elective office at a local level, and I, I know the, the, the pressure that elected officers always feel to deliver for our constituents. And I think that's one of the things we see happening at the federal government level. It's not really very satisfying to your constituent to say, well, that's really a state law issue, so we'll leave that to the states. Uh, that brings to, to, to my mind Justice Scalia's famous statement rather recently that federalism is a dead letter anyway. Um, and 
that concerns me. I wonder whether one of the answers we don't need to have as a group of state law organizations uh, is some willingness to monitor what's happening uh, from a litigation perspective, particularly at the Supreme Court level, and a strategy for working together to, to be sure that when the Supreme Court's deciding things, they're paying attention to the interests of, of groups like the Governors Association, the National Conference of State Legislators, uh, and the Uniform Laws Commission to say, oh, you know, federalism is in the Constitution and does have meaning. Just love to have your thoughts. Yeah, I think it's very, I think it's very interesting, and I, I very much agree with the premise. And I think the uh, one of the areas that I've really tried to focus on uh, in my administration is to make sure that everybody, I, I have 16 cabinet departments, and I've been very clear to them from the very first cabinet meeting and pretty much everyone since then, to remind them that their job is not to defend the agency that they lead. Their job is to put the citizen at the center of everything they do, and particularly to recognize that citizens could care less if a problem they're having is the responsibility of our Department of Education or our Health Department. For that matter, they don't care if it's a responsibility of the city government they live in, the county government they live in, the state government, or the federal government. And so I think this is probably a lot easier to pull off in a state like Delaware, where we have uh, we, we only have three members of our congressional delegation who are very plugged into what's going on locally, uh, and where it would not be unusual to have the mayor of a town of like 600 people literally call the U.S. senator because they ran into each other the day before at the grocery store. And so I think that focus on uh, blurring the lines from the citizen's perspective between layers of government is incredibly important. And, as a re and, and, and so I agree with the premise of your question that we, it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure uh, that folks at the federal level and sort of really all levels rem remember that. Thank you, Governor. Governor, I just had one final um, question. You had mentioned earlier um, the idea that you, you mentioned the phrase seat at the table and part of what we're trying to do in the symposium we had two years ago and in this symposium is to provide a better seat at the table for the Uniform Law Commission but work with our brother and sister state organizations to try to have a louder and better voice on issues that relate to our organizations and the interface with the federal government. Uh, you've led the NGA. Uh, do you have any advice for what we can do better in a cooperative fashion, not only at the ULC level, but CSG, NCSL, and all the others to, to better integrate? Because as someone once said, we all either hang together or we hang separately. And at some point, uh, sometimes we feel like that. I think it's all about communication. I mean, you know, my experience is that 95% of the things that go wrong uh, are a result of lack of communication. And I think it's, um, uh, there's probably a very good opportunity for the Uniform Law Commission to figure out which issues uh, there may be an overlap of interest on uh, and to sit down with people at the NGA or the League of Cities or the National Council of State Legislators, legislatures or, or, or whatever it is. Um, that's the one advantage to, you know, I guess your national organization is based in, in, in Chicago, but to the extent that you have people in Washington on a regular basis making sure that there is some kind of frequent conversation with these other groups so that when you're developing your own agenda for the year, uh, you're developing it not in a vacuum and saying this is only the interest of the Uniform uh, Law Commission, but you're, you're developing it with some of the groups. And I mean, as an example, much of the work around the, co the common core standards around education was an initiative of the National Governors Association partnered with the, the chief state school officers. And there are, I think, so many examples of this where groups have gotten together. There may be some things you would disagree, some things you may agree on. Mm -hmm. That's the way of the world. But the, you know, I think the, the, the challenge and the opportunity is to figure out as early on as possible where your interests overlap and then forge those partnerships together. And I'm, I, I know I speak on behalf of NGA uh, that we'd be interested in having those conversations. That's great. Well, I can't thank you more. We can't thank you more for taking thank you. the time to answer more questions uh, than you did in your uh, spend more time on answering questions than you did in your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Right. This has been very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you.